So I want to take you back 30 years, back to the 80s. Big hair, sappy love songs, and specifically 1987. So 1987, I was a second year medical student. And I was taken up to the patient floor to meet Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Jones was going to be the first patient encounter I had, my first H&P. What an H&P is is a history and physical examination. This isn't just a coffee discussion. This is asking a patient complex questions, getting information from the patient, and processing it uh, in order to give the patient a differential diagnosis of what they have and a treatment plan. It's the first step of developing a doctor-patient relationship. So I walk in very nervous. My first question was, Mrs. Jones, what brought you here today? Her answer was, a cab. I wrote down, a cab. <laughs> now, I had no idea what she was saying. I saw her mouth move. I heard words come out. I had no knowledge base whatsoever. I had one year of medical school under my belt, and I had no idea what she was saying to me. Um, when I went to do the physical exam, I listened to her heart. There was no heart. So I was the first student to examine a patient who was alive with no heart. I'm convinced of that. And my diagnosis there, I did, what I wrote down, was uh, difficult to auscultate heart sounds. What that means is I can't hear the heart. So Hippocrates in 400 BC talked about the importance of a strong doctor-patient relationship. That was the, that you needed that to improve care, to improve health care. So I was convinced at this point Hippocrates is spinning in his grave because I have no idea what I'm doing. And I was convinced that Mrs. Jones thought I wasted, get this, two hours of her time. Two hours of her time. When I went to shake her hand, she looked at me and she had a smile on her face. And I realized I didn't waste two hours of her time. She had two hours of my time and she was able to unload her burdens on me. Mrs. Jones was twice my age. She was an African-American woman and we were cultures apart. And that doctor-patient relationship was able to transcend gender, race, and culture. And I started to get an inkling of how important that relationship is in the healing process. So what does it take to get to that point of having a strong doctor-patient relationship? Well, first you need a strong doctor. You have to be able, you have to train a physician, you have to give them a knowledge base, you have to download information into their brain so they understand what to ask, how to ask it, and how to apply that to medical information that's available. Then you need experiential learning. You need to do this over and over again. So now I'm an emergency physician, and when I hire young physicians who come and practice, what I find is after four years of medical school and three or four years of residency training, it takes them another three to five years, which in our world equates to 10 to 15,000 patient encounters, before I actually feel like they know what they're doing and before they will admit to me that I think I get it now. That's how much time it takes. Uh, once you establish that relationship, everything starts working great. In fact, studies have shown that when you have a strong doctor-patient relationship, healthcare improves. Management of chronic medical conditions gets easier. Patients' adherence to taking medications as prescribed gets better. Their, their perception of their pain improves. They have less pain, believe it or not. If they get admitted to the hospital, their length of stay in the hospital shortens. This is huge. On the doctor's side, doctors have more satisfaction in their jobs. They actually get sued less, which in and of itself is job satisfaction when you're not getting sued. So you have the patient happy, you have the doctor happy, you have health care improving, and you have cost decreasing. So it's a good thing. So I should just end my talk here and say that's it. So why do I have the audacity to stand in front of you and say we need to fix this relationship? The reason is because I think from the time of Hippocrates to now, we've had wedges go between doctors and patients. And in the last 30 years, we've had an exponential increase in the wedges that get between the doctor and the patient. Some of it is just the business of medicine. We have fewer doctors in, in, in places where we really need them. We have more patients. We have sicker patients. We have an, a, an aging population. We get that. That's not what I want to focus on. Many papers have been written on that. Instead, what I'm going to talk to you about is data information overload. So we have enormous amounts of data out there. Remember, I talked about what it takes to get a physician to the point of, of being able to sit down with a patient 
and, and start that patient relation, that doctor-patient relationship. It takes information download. You almost, it's almost impossible to download information now because there's so much out there. The, um, the, in fact, in, in studies done, we saw that in the decade between 75, 1975 and 1985, on average every year, there was a quarter of a million new research articles per year put in the National Library of Medicine. A decade later, that went to 370, and a decade later, it went to 400, 400,000 new research articles. So we have information overload. We also have something that I call asymmetric development of information technology. We've done an enormous job with growing equipment and hardware technology. And we've done a poor job in developing data analytics and management of the data that's out there. So what you're left with, you're left with doctors that have a different uh, standard of care now that's been developed. So we have access to us to the best equipment ever. And when you talk to physicians from other parts of the world, they can't believe what we have available to us. So you have this enormous amount of technology your standard of care now almost warrants that you utilize that technology. And that technology is uncovering new diseases. When I trained, there was no such thing as hepatitis C. It was non-A, non-B hepatitis. We weren't even sure if it was infectious or non-infectious. We had uh, autoimmune diseases were there. They were short little chapters in the textbook. Uh, but now you're, you're, starting to see a res you're starting to see more of these diseases. I'm not convinced that we're seeing more of it. I, I think we can uncover it now with the technology we have. So we have more technology. We have apparently new diseases out there. And then we have new treatments for those diseases. It's almost impossible for doctors to keep up. Now, patients have the same access to information. They have much more access to information than they used to. So they, they can go online and they look things up. In fact, when they come and talk with a doctor, they tell you. So, I, I have stomach pain, I looked it up, I'm sure it's cancer. I need this CAT scan, these blood tests, and, and these things done. And the doctor says, you sure it's not that bag of hot Cheetos that you ate last night at midnight? They say, absolutely not, I do that every night. Do yeah, that's the point, that maybe that's what it is. That's not it, doctor. Now, we don't have time to have a discussion to talk patients from, that, from their perception, from their, from their viewpoint. Um, so, Doctors succumb to ordering more tests than they need to, um, prescribing medications when they don't need to, or patients will doctor shop. The other thing the information overload does is it becomes hard to become a specialist in one area, so you tend to refer patients to other physicians. So all this increases health, the cost of healthcare, and it deteriorates the doctor-patient relationship. So what we need to do is we need to, we need to get everything back on track. And I think one case that kind of highlights where we were, and we understood this in medicine. We knew in medicine we had this chasm developing. And in the mid-90s, we started to implement electronic medical records. And, and I think the case that I always go back to, and it actually was the start of my research, was the 1995 heat disaster. So in Chicago, we had, in July, one week time period where it was hot. Well, it's July. But we had 700 people die in a week. 700 people in a week. Think of the last time you read the newspaper opened up and it's 700 people died in the city this week. It just doesn't happen. I was working clinically at the time, and I tell you, it took us almost two days to figure out our patients were dying from heat. It's, a, it's, it's absurd to think of, but that's the truth. And the reason why is we had paper and pen, we worked in our silos, and we didn't see the forest through the trees. And so we knew we had to get better. And so what you saw over the next five years was the, the implementation of electronic medical records. So Nietzsche is credited with uh, saying that that which does not kill us makes us stronger. We knew that the vast amounts of data out there actually created a wedge between patients. But we're too far downstream to turn back and say, let's not do this. So we double down. We need more information. But we need to manage that information differently. I'm here to tell you that we are at that point now. So we're at a point where I'm convinced we're in a new revolution. Like the Industrial Revolution, we are in the healthcare data analytics revolution. You won't see it yet. And, and like in the Industrial Revolution, uh, historians will debate, well, did it really start in 1760 or not? Because it was a, it's not really a revolution, because it's a gradual increase. It's a gradual disruption of what's happening in society. And that's what's happening in healthcare with data analytics. We're having a gradual improvement. In the end, you will see changes. You'll see decreased healthcare costs. You'll see improvement in outcomes. 
just can't see it yet. So if you fast forward 50 years from now, I guarantee you, you'll look up this TED Talk 50 years from now, and, uh, and you'll see what I'm saying is correct. Um, so we're, we're going to, we're, we're moving the dial on this. So what you have is you have traditional researchers out there, and when I say traditional researchers, I think of older physicians like myself in white coats doing NIH-funded research, looking at data analytics, and, they're, and, they're, and they're, they're moving the dial there. You have non-traditional pseudo-research, which is done by younger, high-tech entrepreneurs who are implementing disruptive healthcare technology. I've had the pleasure of working with both teams, and it's really fascinating to work with both. And out of there, you, you have hybrid teams, a little bit of each. My research team is actually more of a hybrid team. So we have clinicians who are content experts about disease. We have statistics experts. We have public health experts. We have informaticists. We have interface experts. And we have programmers. It's a lot of fun, guys. Uh, and we sit and we, and we try and problem solve. And what we've been able to do is we've been able to look at all the data that's coming out of electronic medical records. And it's not as easy as you might think because all systems have a different language. So we've created a system that's agnostic to all the systems out there. And we're able to look at the information. And I tell you, it's like looking under a microscope and seeing a bacteria for the first time. You start to see trends unfold. And, and what we've been able to do with that, so we can, we can look at a patient's medical record in real time, and I say that because that's important, to get the doctor back in front of the patient. So we can, our system can look at a medical record and read what the clinician, whether it's a doctor or a nurse or a student, what they've entered into the medical record, whether it's a button click or even if it's typewritten. We spent a year on a natural language processor that actually now for the first time in history can read doctor's handwriting. <laughs> and what we've been able to pull out of there is fascinating. We can now, we've, we've developed algorithms, what we call disease fingerprinting. We developed algorithms around identification of rarely occurring diseases that we know doctors will not diagnose because they're so rarely occurring, they don't want to be the one to say the patient has that condition. And we can let a doctor know, hey, we think it's this condition. Have you considered these tests to prove or disprove this theory? We, we do that with rarely occurring diseases. We also do it with annually occurring diseases like influenza. Our system has been so effective, we can predict flu season one to two weeks before CDC says, hey, we're in flu season. So I've missed a lot of inter good interview opportunities because reporters will say, doctor, are we in flu season? I'll say, no, it ended last week. So it, it keeps me out of the spotlight, but our system works, works that good. It has that level of sensitivity. We've also expanded the definition of disease. So if you say that admitting somebody to a hospital is a disease in and of itself, We've been able to identify the variables to lead, that lead to patients being admitted to the hospital. And so we can let a doctor know this patient is going to need to be admitted before the doctor has even completed their workup. Why is that important? It gets the patient where they need at the right time, gets them care faster, and it decreases extraneous testing the doctor may do to decide themselves if the patient needs to be admitted. We also have collaborated, and collaboration is a big part of being ready for whatever's coming down our way. We've collaborated with a company, and get this, we're working on predicting medical errors before medical errors happen. Medical errors do not occur in isolation. They occur as a series of unfortunate events. We actually can put values on that series of unfortunate events. And we can tell clinicians, hey, something bad's going to happen here, and we know that here, so do something to stop it from happening. This is a game changer in healthcare, and we're actually working on that right now. So you might say, well, aren't you also predicting the end of the role of a physician? And I'm here to tell you no. So automation didn't get rid of factory workers. It did reduce the workforce, but it, it also led to efficiency. ATMs didn't get rid of bank tellers, uh, made them more efficient. Doctors aren't going anywhere, but we need to make them more efficient. So I'll end with a story. About 20 years ago, um, I was working on an inpatient unit, and there was a patient, we'll call her Beatrice, because I can't use her real name, an elderly woman who was afflicted with multiple strokes. So she lived in a nursing home. She had beautiful, long, white hair. She would always end up in the hospital. Nobody wanted to take care of her because her care was so complicated. I took care of her, and I knew her from years of taking care of her, so it wasn't that complicated for me. 
One morning I walk in and the nurse says to me, Dr. Beatrice isn't doing well, she had a rough night, you might want to go see her. The, the family had made her a DNR, so do not resuscitate, no life-sustaining intervention. But what we could do is keep her comfortable. I went in the room and uh, she was having a hard time breathing. Uh, she looked at me uh, and, and I wanted, I did draw a blood test because I wanted to see if there was something I could do in addition to keeping her comfortable. Is there something we were missing that we could correct? When I drew the blood, I held pressure where I drew the blood from so, where she, was, so she wouldn't bleed and I held her hand and she looked up at me and, and she had a little smile on her face and she closed her eyes and she took her last breath and she left. And I'd like to think that she waited for me that morning because I'd spent years working with her. I'd also like to think that the last minutes of her life on earth was comforted by my presence being there. That's the doctor-patient relationship. That will not go away. We're just going to make it better. Thank you. <laughs>